My question is, when it comes to the technology side of it and your organization supporting the internal technology portion to get the policy set up, to get the staff available who can either assist in creating the website, how has that worked for you? Was it a tough task to get them to move into that level of getting the technology folks involved? This is Tim Moore. From our perspective, we're essentially a two-person team in the communications group, and we're highly leveraged with outside contractors, so all of our hosting and uh, hardware and software services up to the OS level are handled by Rackspace. We just bring in development contractors because the technology moves pretty quickly. We found that the versatility and the ability to kind of move on is a little bit easier for us to work with. Morgan, do you think the Facebook and Twitter followers might be the same folks since the number are nearly the same at 3,200? Maybe one of the services could be dropped from your program if this is the case. Maybe the other presenters can also weigh in on what services are thought to be the most valuable for customer outreach. Actually, no, we found that they're not the same, and we learned that through cold hard experience. We were posting some information, uh, service disruption, and that's one of the things that we found about Twitter is that it is an incredibly powerful tool about service disruptions. In fact, we're planning on developing a second Twitter handle on service disruptions so we can kind of take some of the noise, if you will, off of uh, at Dark Media, which is the one Twitter handle we have now. And, and we learned that uh, when we we're posting material to Twitter thinking, well, that's the only, you know, everybody's on Twitter and that's all they care about. We started getting pounded by the Facebook users. Why aren't you telling us about, I forget the particular incident. And so what we did from a back office approach, Lawrence Sutton, one of our rocket scientists here, built a publisher tool. And so we're able to hit all of our communications platforms from a single uh, tool. And, and so we found that Facebook people like Facebook. They don't necessarily care for Twitter or they don't spend a lot of time there. The Twitter users are the same way. They're a unique breed. I do have a little bit of updated numbers. We've seen a little more growth in Twitter. But, uh, yeah, we were kind of struck when we started looking at it going, wow, they same number. It was kind of a, an interesting one for us. Let me add to that also that, to some extent, agencies themselves try to tailor the content they are putting out to the medium. So as Morgan said, Twitter especially, agencies like to use that for the real-time updates, the service disruption information, whereas Facebook, they use that for that as well, but they also use it for more fun items or more community-building activities. So sometimes agencies themselves pick and choose what type of content they want to put on what what social media platform. Do any of the presenters have any insight on using social media during an environmental program? Yeah, this is Morgan. You could do some unique messaging promoting environmental causes in an online environment. We've done things on Facebook and, and Twitter. I don't know that, that we've really found a unique use necessarily for social media to promote that specific kind of a program. You know, some communities are certainly more wired than others, so there's some, some opportunities there. We've done a number of things with the bike community and, and people like that, so some are more wired than others, but I don't have a, a lot more for you than that. Sorry. Since new Facebook timeline, I can't figure out how to invite friends to like our fan page. Question mark. Can anyone provide her guidance? <laughs> I'm sure there's a way, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. I mean, that, that seems like something that should be in the, um, in like the, the materials, the, the yeah. materials. The, you know, the help, the help page on Facebook, perhaps. That might be better qualified for that yeah. question. Morgan, if the mobile app from Dart is available for sale to smaller agencies, and it looks as if Morgan did respond to say, no, it's a site we built send contact information and we'll visit with you about it. Morgan, you might get more people who are interested in that. That's fine. We've talked about how we could monetize something like that, but one of the things that's been our approach from day one, actually going back to when we built the first website, and I think Tim would agree, and, and Susan I think probably saw this during the research, creating all of this stuff 
is a community experience. You have to have partners throughout the agency who are just willing to look at this as a blank page and how do we fill this blank page with interesting, relevant content. And so we've just been incredibly blessed to have some really smart people help us solve some of these problems. So if we could bottle it and sell it, yeah, I know my board of directors would be really happy. When looking at the staff to handle the social media, what is the experience level? This is Tim Moore from BART. I've seen the tendency of some agencies and you know even real businesses to a certain extent say, oh, well, you know, let's bring in a kid from college or whatever and to try and do this because they're young and it's social media and stuff like that. And I guess maybe that would work for some folks, but in our agency, the primary person who engages in social with our customers has a graduate degree from Columbia. It's Melissa Jordan here, she's the other 50% of our interactive team. She was a reporter for many years with the San Jose Mercury News, and there's a certain ability to read feedback quickly and respond to it with proper tone. I think that's really advantageous to us, and we're super, super lucky to have her. So if you can work in that area, that's kind of where we found some success. Yeah, I would add, this is Susan, that among the agencies that I spoke with during the research, as Tim said, some of them did let interns handle the social media, and some of the smaller agencies, it was the general manager who was sending out the tweets in the morning. It really depends. I've also spoken to agencies who use interns, but the second some critical, sensitive event happens, they pull the intern off and start using senior managers who do, as Tim said, understand the tone, know how to respond, know how to stay on message. So it, it really varies with the agency, but there definitely needs to be a certain level of judgment and ability to engage with customers that doesn't always come easily. Yeah, this Morgan, I'll just echo that and add that the key is the ability to write well and write concisely or I guess I should say write well concisely. When we have brought people in to participate in any of our social media communications, I'm old school and we do a writing test and we find out how clearly they can articulate a message, not in 140 characters, but 110 or 120 characters because we're looking for retweets and extensions of the message. We're also looking for judgment. You have some kids that pick it up right away and you have some old dogs that I wouldn't let get near our Twitter account who could write well but they just couldn't do it and so it's just really a matter of, of spending time with the individual and getting to know what they can do. Do you have any lessons learned to share or common mistakes that you would advise an agency just starting with social media to avoid? This is Tim Moore. I would echo what Susan was saying. The most important thing is just to kind of get in and start listening and to appreciate the tone and the, the way that you would interact with these folks. And I always kind of viewed it as a conversation with friends to a certain extent as far as tone and stuff like that was concerned. I think that was the biggest hurdle for us at least. Yeah, I think that's key. Don't be afraid to experiment and don't be afraid to to stop doing something. You have to be a little fearless and you have to have a thick skin because people will call you all kinds of things using the words that George Carlin says we can't use. And so those are probably the, the biggest things, but mainly it's just get in and try it. I think another thing that I've heard from agencies also is it's important to own your mistakes. If you do make a mistake, either in terms of something you say online or some aspect of your service, it's okay to acknowledge it and to take responsibility for it and move on. And I think that's an important piece of the whole conversation and way of engaging with customers. Regarding Twitter, is anyone archiving and analyzing their tweets? If so, how? What services or software are being used? This is Morgan. No, we don't archive them. We study them, look for patterns, but they're not archived. We use TweetDeck 
so we can follow not only the specific conversation, but we look at a number of different Twitter feeds where we tend to pop up. We also look for uh, different hashtags that might uh, involve us. One of them is hashtag DART, which turns up not only Dallas Area Rapid Transit, but Des Moines and Dar es Salaam and Dublin and a Google language that people in Europe really don't seem to like very much. The Dart game, fans of Dodge Darts, but a lot of people still put hashtag Dart when they say something about us. So that tool, you know, gives us a broad reach, but really we don't have any kind of in-depth analytical tool. There may be some that are out there, but I haven't found anything which would be in, within our budget, which is kind of non-existent. This is Tim from BART. Yeah, we use TweetDeck as well for the same thing, searching on hashes and searching on ads and following conversations in that way. We do one thing in the course of the week. We'll swap off and try to essentially encapsulate what we see, the trending conversations that we see by just pulling off some of those out of TweetDeck and keeping them in a Microsoft Word file on our desktop so that we can tap some of that intelligence, what's being talked about, back to executives and others in the organization, our customer services group. That's really the extent of the kind of analysis. I think from our perspective, I don't even really know how many followers we have on Twitter right now. I should probably look that up. But the universe is, all things considered, not that large. And I think if it grew more, we would probably try to look at some tools, but we just don't have the, the budget or the justification to do that right now. Do you have staff dedicated to social media? Do you split the time among employees, or do you hire an agency to handle? This is Morgan. We have some staff that I'd say they're dedicated to that, but it's part of what they do. They're focusing in the online communication primarily. I don't have a single person who does nothing but social media, but we do have staff that is a day-to-day -day part of what they do. This is Tim Moore at Bar. There's two of us in the interactive team, Melissa Jordan and I, and she primarily handles the day-to-day -day interactions that are occurring in the space, and then I back her up. That's on our main accounts. All of the interactions are handled in that way. What we're trying to do and what I tried to articulate in the presentation was to really push some of these responsibilities out into the organization to subject matter experts who can begin to build their own communities of influence around individual planning projects and customer services, that kind of thing. And so our intent is not to dedicate this to anybody. I think eventually social, and even I'm seeing people coming into the organization now, is just going to be viewed as a, another tool like the phone or like email that is governed by best practices and policy at the organizational level that people in the business are going to be using to interact with their stakeholders and customers. And that's the model that we're trying to pursue. This is Susan. In many agencies, the social media staffing is housed within the marketing and communications department, but as Tim and Morgan were saying, it's pretty rare for agencies to have a dedicated individual. I think Washington Metro is one of the few agencies that I've encountered that actually has a social media manager. Most of them seem to split it up among different employees. If you're interested in the publisher concept that Morgan presented, you can send him an email or contact him using the information that was provided in the presentation. The next question for both Tim and Morgan. What was the most effective strategy you implemented to vastly increase the number of your followers on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc.? Do you buy user data from either Facebook or Twitter or any of the other agencies or software platforms you use? I think the most effective strategy to increase your followers is to be interesting. Buying stuff, trying to pump up your numbers like that, that's really a short-term thing. You might be able to pick up a few likes and followers, but what are they going to be worth to you as a number? It's like having a database of email addresses when nobody's opening your email. So I think numbers are kind of an easy handle to quantify, but really the interactions and the percentage of interactions to followers are kind of what we were, or at least what I was trying to talk about a little bit in, in my presentation. And I think it would be best to not even focus on that or try to get the organization off of thinking that pumping up your numbers is important.
Yeah, I think beyond interesting in the image that Tim had in his presentation of the ballet dancer hopping on the train, interesting content is incredibly important. And I would add to that that it has to be relevant content. One of the things we find, and it's not really a matter of strategy, but a matter of observation for us, is that when we have major service events, we're coming up to the State Fair of Texas where uh, we have two rail stations, and over a three-week period, three million of the region's closest personal friends will descend on this one area, and a lot of them are going to come in on DART. And so our traffic will go up on these different tools during that time. We find during winter, and we actually have some in North Texas, that our traffic on the social media platforms goes up because we become more relevant to people. So I think you have to be interesting and you have to be relevant. We have tried a number of approaches as part of our overall communication strategy to drive traffic. We've had some success, but haven't found that magic thing if it exists yet to really push it out there beyond just being interesting and being relevant. And I would add being interactive. If people know that the agency is listening to them and responding to them and following them and they can ask a question and get an answer, I think that also helps build a strong community of followers. Is there any open source software to help with creating or building a mobile app? I wanted actually to point out, I think Morgan and I, or Bart and Dart, have very similar ideas as far as mobile apps and web apps are concerned. And I think we need to draw the distinction between a native mobile app, that's something that you download, for example, onto your iPhone or Android device, that's kind of a standalone piece of software, and a mobile web app, which is a mobile optimized web page that is accessible through any browser on any mobile device. And the latter strategy, that is creating a very simple mobile website that serves real-time information and delay advisories and scheduling and that sort of thing to customers in the mobile context, that is the approach that we're taking at BART and also at DART. And from our perspective, at BART, we're using open data to serve the native mobile app space. We're not really looking at creating mobile apps, per se, or using any of that software. We're really just relying on third parties and creating uh, developer communities and supporting them to do that. Tim's exactly right, and we were able to have a good conversation about that during the rail conference. We felt that we wanted to make as much information as possible available to as large a group as possible, and so that's why we took this particular approach. Now, at the same time, we are advancing a mobile ticketing tool over the next several months, and there will probably be an app that is part of that, but it will be resident within the mobile ticketing solution. But really, we wanted to give customers the full experience, and there are pretty robust developer communities out there that are finding a lot of ways to use the Google Transit feed. Okay, your next question, actually it was directed towards Tim. How do you encourage developers to use the BART API and create open source apps? <laughs> that was great timing on both of those questions, I think. I would love to talk to you about that separately and really briefly. A simple license is really important. Our license is like 250 words, and it's got to be accessible and easy for, for developers to understand. Multiple paths in. We have various levels of services for various skill levels of developers. That's key. Open and structured data is important, something that's really well documented and open and available for developers to understand. We try to promote their applications by kind of curating them on BART.gov for customers to go review and look at and download. We try to position our open data services in a real prominent spot on the website. Things like research, we try to connect the needs of our customers through research that we do to the skills of the developers and close that loop so that developers can deliver services that our customers are looking for and a couple of other things with community and stuff like that. But please contact me on Twitter or wherever. I think it's on my presentation, and I'd love to talk to you more about that.
We are a small transit organization in Breckenridge, Colorado. My only interest is to use Twitter to state service issues, cancellations, or special services. For those that use Twitter, is it easy for passengers that follow us to criticize our services? This is Morgan. Yes, somebody's stuck on a train, on a bus, at a platform, whatever, and they're not happy and they're looking for somebody that they can vent to, and they do. And if you spend any time looking at our feed, you'll see us having conversations about it. That is the nature of the beast. I think also we should maybe pass this prologue and take some learning from the experiences at Washington Metro. And I don't mean to pick on them because we're all just kind of trying to find our way through these, these new services, but they had launched a delay advisory feed that they had connected to Twitter, and it was just this machine-generated thing that sometimes cut off delay advisories and wasn't really audited or, I guess, monitored by anybody there. And so because there was a lack of human interaction there, it just kind of invited people to talk and not hear a response and get more frustrated. And I think that was a really valuable lesson for all of us, and I think they've really turned that around and taken that experience to heart and built upon it. Yeah, I agree absolutely. And I think the other thing is that people are going to be having these conversations about you whether or not you are on Twitter. The advantage of your being on Twitter is that you can participate in these conversations and engage people. And that's really the key. It's about transparency because for the two or three people who are wailing on you on Twitter, there are probably 30 or 40 others who are watching the conversation who will benefit from that information. And we have seen situations where people didn't start out on Twitter, but they got information via one of our other channels. They hopped over to Twitter to engage the person criticizing us. Well, I got this information on this tool, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, again, an example of how all of this stuff works together. And actually, I think, to our benefit. Please share any knowledge regarding keeping public records of social media communication. This is Morgan. I'll preface this by saying your experience and your state law may vary, but we don't keep them. Yeah, I agree. It varies from state to state, and you really need to check with your with your locality. Some some states do consider social media posts to be the same as emails, to be the same as any kind of public record, and require archiving. Others have not addressed that yet. Many people believe it's only a matter of time before social media posts are considered the same as any other agency communication, but the rules are not uniform. Could you expand a bit more on how you measured engagement? By engagement, are we referring to structured programs as compared to service incidents? The issue I'm struggling with is how to quantify a non-quantifiable measurement in public service. This is Tim. I think everybody who uses social media is struggling with that. On Facebook in particular, there are specific metrics provided by Facebook Insights that measure not only reach but engagement, and that's kind of what we're using on that side. I think there are other tools that measure retweets, for example, on Twitter, or instances in which your hashtag or at is included, and those types of conversations, and they try to measure this so-called sentiment analysis, which I don't really support that much. This is a really great question. We're just using the tools that are provided to us by the platforms that offer them. She was looking for updated uh, age distribution data, and uh, I believe, Morgan, you did respond that the Pew Foundation does an annual report on social media use, so anyone interested can Google Pew Foundation to get that information. In your opinion, what is a reasonable follow-up response time when a follower inquiries about an issue that needs research? 48 hours? This Morgan, our commitment is to give a response in 24 hours at some level on a weekday. Weekends are off. Sometimes if one of us doesn't have a life and we actually happen to be online, we'll try to respond if we know the information. But we want to give at least an acknowledgement response, and some of those come immediately. And the response may be, we got your whatever, 
give us a little time to do the research and we'll get back to you. It also gives us an opportunity if we need to uh, direct message somebody on Twitter because sometimes someone will ask us a very specific question that really is more appropriately handled offline or in a DM. And so we try to get in right away and typically within 48 hours we've got the information. Again, it goes back to one of my early comments about being part of a larger entity. We are fortunate that folks at DART who have not involved in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis get the importance of what we do. And so when one of our guys sends them an email, makes a phone call, asks for information, they know that we're on a deadline. And they're quite responsive to that. I think it's been very helpful to us. I think the selection depends on where the information comes from. And I can say starting in the social space, since that's what we're talking about, like on Twitter, we only really respond to direct messages and straight up ads to us. If we were really engaged, we would go out and insert ourselves into conversations and when people say stuff about us, kind of acknowledge that. But we're just not at that level. And when we get a DM, for example, we'll try to turn it around as fast as we can during the day within like 10 minutes. Now, if it does require some sort of research or if it's something that just you can't handle in 140 characters, we will often direct people to use our comment form, art.gov slash comments, and you will see a lot of airlines and, and other transportation providers that are in our frame of reference from a customer perspective. It's kind of an old marketing term doing this. So they're not really doing that heavy lifting in Twitter. They're just referring people to channels that are already established. That being said, sometimes research on an item takes a week. And I think the key thing that we try to do is just get back to the customer every other day to just say, you know, hey, we haven't forgotten about you. We're still looking into this, that sort of thing, just trying to manage expectations a little more effectively. Did any of you quantify the impact on snail mail and call center operations when social media tools were added to the mix of communication channels? This is Tim. No. This is Morgan. Actually, we started before the social media part. Once we started using online trip planning, web-based trip planning, we began looking at the number of calls that we were I don't want to say taking away because it sounds like we're in a competitive environment with a call center, but the time we could give the call center and the number of calls we could handle either via, in this case, the online trip planner and a lot of times via the social media tools. So we report that information on a monthly basis to our call center so that they know what, what's going on and the kinds of questions and concerns. So again, it, they reinforce each other. They feed each other. Yeah, and I've heard anecdotally from some agencies that it seems to have reduced some of the burden on call centers, but I haven't seen anything quantified. And I think it's not just social media. It's the availability of online trip planning or real-time information through mobile apps that's also reducing the pressure on call centers. So it's a combination of user tools.